Welcome to Republican Roundtable. I'm Max Reimer. We are here today filming a day after Election Day 2018. With me today, I have a good friend, confidant in many ways, Kip Christensen. We are here to break down everything that happened yesterday. Kip, thank you for joining the Republican Roundtable. Hi, Max. Thanks for having me. So let's, uh, let's get into it. <laughs> yeah. Because I think what we saw nationally was right around what we expected. We had a few seats picked up in the Senate, in the House. We, we did lose the House as Republicans. Right. But when you actually get into Minnesota, we got clubbed Shellacked. repeatedly. Yeah. I don't think it, many people can remember losses as bad as we took for candidates, as good as we thought our candidates were. Give us your overall insight into what happened election day and what lessons we take from it, if any. I think nationally, obviously, we saw that the blue wave got stopped. Um, it wasn't, it, CNN was out there saying, you know, no blue wave. But what we have here in Minnesota is an isolated pocket of a wave pool. And we got, we got rolled. Um, we got rolled by a machine that is built upon exceptional organizing. Um, this is the epicenter of Democrat organizing across the country. Um, there are organizations like the Wellstone Action, I, I think Wellstone Action, and then their Organizing Institute, various other training programs, um, New Organizing Institute, which I think is now defunct, but they all got kind of rolled into one in the epicenter of Democrat DFL training is actually here in Minneapolis. And so a lot of their graduates both come from here and then go here when they graduate from those, um, they're not formal institutions, but mm -hmm. they're, they're training type institutions. And they train best practices for campaigns. And there's a lot of stuff that is trialed and uh, explored here and to find out what works and what doesn't. And there's a lot of innovation that goes on in Minnesota. And I think we saw that when you stop swimming, just like a shark, you die. Mm -hmm. um, we stop breathing, we, st we cease to exist as a party, and if you stop innovating on the organizing front, we need to take a serious gut check from what we saw last night. No one's gonna carry it, no personality, no cult of personality of the president. We also need to realize that, honestly, Trump did not himself cause the change where we get within 40,000 votes of flipping Minnesota, which has been solid since 72. That's not the president. Um, You're is, referencing in 2016. In 2016. When, when, when he was on the ballot. Right. We almost won, which is, I, we I almost, think. We almost gave our electoral votes to Trump. Yes, um, which I think is what was encouraging for a lot of people this time around. It was right. like, look how close we are. We might be changing as a state. Obviously, we need to go f far in this direction without thinking about um, what is a good candidate that's a good fit for the district? Um, what is a good candidate for a statewide election? Um, we need to have some serious self-assessment, some serious reflection on how we look at the endorsement process from a practical standpoint. We need to be realists about winning elections and the process and uh, tools with which we do that. Right now, we need to step up our game in terms of door knocking phones, um, helping support our candidates um, as activists. Signs do not vote, parades do not vote, voter contacts produce votes. Mm -hmm. And if we're not doing voter contacts effectively, if we are not using, we have superior data to the Democrats. They will admit that readily. NGP van has really not been all that improved since the 2008 election cycle when it really launched onto the scene mm -hmm. for the Obama election, which, which it was kind of its big debut, I think. Um, it's not been extremely improved. The RNC nationally, and you saw, you saw how it stymied this, red wave, this blue wave nationally. Mm -hmm. The RNC put $20 million into the data program nationally. Meanwhile, Minnesota was behind the eight ball because we had been stuck on Phoenix until 20, it was our own internal data program until okay. 2012. And so while other parties around the country who, that live under a different model that do not involve, um, that do not involve the caucus type system, they had been organizing it more in line with national data. And so people at the grassroots level were primed and ready to 
take advantage of this, these massive leaps in data that we have had recently. You know, you've got, you've got two competing data universes, I360, which is used by some groups, and the data center universe, which is used by others. Right. In both, there are about 3,000 data points on every individual registered voter. In I360, it's not just the voters, it's every single person. And so, in our data universe, we have incredible opportunities that, are, that go missed from voter registration, bringing out more new votes, more new people. But we have not had a moment like last night where we actually have to look at ourselves in the mirror, take a real serious appraisal of where we are. Honestly, up until this point, I think we've taken a couple too many cycles of thinking, you know, if we'd just done a couple things differently, it all would have been different. We lost the entire donut around the metro. Yeah. All the suburbs, gone. It's gone. Gonzo, it's Poof. It's, yeah, it's, go look it up. It's pull, about, pull up a map. Go look it up. It's a really wonderful circle. It's gone. It's about as bad as um, it, bad as it can. Yeah, you can't. You can't. Metro. Nope. Uh, Toast. <clears throat> and statewide too. You well, know. Well, when we talk about organizing, because you had used that word a few times right. uh, for our viewers at home, organizing is things like door knocking, lit dropping, phone calling. Is mm. that what we're is that what we're getting at, or is it's it more? Something? It's that and more than that. Okay. Um, so, because why? A two, it, yeah. It's a two-pronged yep. question. What is it? Yep. And why is the DFL just better at it? Heads and tails right. better at it in this state. Right. Um, so I've, I've, I'll answer that quick. I want to do a quick soapbox on lit dropping. Okay. Um, lit dropping is a net loser for Republicans. Completely a net loser from a tactical, strategic, and, and strategic point. Um, if you're not targeting specific doors where there is a voter who can be persuaded with this piece of literature, which costs 20 cents, that may be a small value, but is a non-negligible value when you're knocking thousands and thousands of doors, mm -hmm. right? So if you're putting a piece of literature on every single door, and what is, what is consistent about lit drops? Lit drops happen in cities where people are densely packed, um, where it, in even small towns of 200 people, those locations, even in western Minnesota, even in greatest Minnesota, rural Minnesota, those locations are the places where you'll find more people of the other party, mm. right? Yes. They're more densely packed. It works great for Democrats because on the average you're turning out more of your people. For Republicans, we might very well be letting people know that a candidate who they really don't like the policies of because of this lit piece is on the ballot next Tuesday. Yeah. Like, and, we're, activating. and we're activating our opposition. Right. Meanwhile, we're also spending money because we're putting lit and we're mm. spending volunteer time and hours mm -hmm. in putting these resources on the ground. Mm -hmm. What are we thinking? We have the tools, we have the data. I can pull out my phone and immediately have an app up on my phone that puts me on top of all the people that can be persuaded to vote my candidate this cycle. I know exactly who the hard R's are, who the hard Republicans are. That's the place where I can go put my sign. I know where the lean ones are who might not show up this cycle. Those are the people I need to remind to vote this cycle. Mm -hmm. I know where the independents are. Those are the people that I need to persuade. I know where the Democrats are. I maybe don't go to that house. Right. You know, right. But I can see that all presently on my phone. And if we're doing accurate, if, you're do if we're doing accurate surveys as well, those databases come back into the system and the candidates can use it. The party can use it. Mm -hmm. however, th however that structure is set up, whether it's candidates or party and how they're siloed, there's a lot of campaign finance stuff that goes into that. But that data comes back and it informs our decisions about who to contact, who needs to be persuaded, who did we just leave a voicemail for, who told us never to call back, I'm voting for the other guys from now on. Mm -hmm. Like all of that stuff needs to be centralized and the BPOUs can do that. Basic political organizing unit or basic political operational unit, there's a couple different ways, but I think it's basic political organizing mm -hmm. unit in the state yeah. of Minnesota. That's what I call it. If, if it is, if it is that, and we are, just basic. Mm -hmm. We are not political. We are not organizing. If we're not using these tools to advance policy agenda, to advance political agenda, if we are not organizing, and I'll get to what that all entails, it's not lit dropping, ideally. Sounds I'll, like it's you know, definitely I'm, I'm, not I'm, lit I'm, dropping. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty torqued up about that one. Um, but on the organizing standpoint, it also involves building a bench. Mm -hmm. It involves the off-cycle election tools. It's not just the last three, four months 
That is not what you're there for, right. ideally, in an ideal situation. Now, I love, I love our activists and all the things that they do do, um, but there's so much more that we need to do because of things like what happened last night. Yes. Um, you need to be reaching out to people outside of your organization. We can't just be talking to the choir, right? We need to be talking to the local insurance agent in town. Reminder, insurance agents know everybody in town. They know who thinks what about what issue. For some weird reason, these are the salesmen that really just get people. Talk to your insurance agents. Talk to your realtors. Bankers usually don't touch this stuff, but your insurance agents and realtors are independent people, largely, who run their own shop. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the people that you can, and quite often, are on our side. Mm -hmm. These are people that you can use as force multipliers. It's a fr I like thinking about politics in military terminology sometimes mm -hmm. because there are a lot of corollaries. Force multipliers in military, you can come in and train six of the uh, of the Northern Alliance, those uh, the Kurds who went in into Afghanistan, that was a force multiplier operation. You brought in specialists who trained people to then go out and use the tools and the techniques that you taught them. Mm -hmm. We are, as BPOUs, as, or as local organizing units, supposed to be training people. Whether it's training them to use the technology, whether it's training them how to make phone calls effectively, whether it's training them to just find out who's in your precinct. Mm -hmm. Get to know them. You know, I've heard of precincts on the DFL side where when someone new moves into the neighborhood, a local BPOU has a specific budget for a care package. Think about that. Wow. We're not doing anything. No. Anything. No. We're not introducing ourselves. You don't have to. You don't. And, and, and in, in that situation, that's obviously a, uh, it runs afoul of campaign finance. I've heard it talked about. I think if anybody actually had some solid information on that out there, um, that could be a problem mm -hmm. um, because you're effectively buying votes. Um, that could be argued. Um, so don't sure. do that. Don't do that, conservatives. Um, but introduce yourself. Yeah. Get to know the new people in the neighborhood. Um, make that, them feel welcome. Is that where our, <clears throat> is that where our fundamental problem lies is organizing because because you hear about specific BPOUs not even being being able to full, uh, fill a whole executive yeah. committee and I feel horrible for them why but but my question is at that point why is that what is the fundamental philosophical difference between us as Republicans and those on the DFL is there one or is it just lack of willingness, lack of heart, lack of personal investment in the process. Why is it different, Kip? We're, we're all human beings. Yeah. We all, we all want our political agenda to be accomplished. Right. We're, be, we're worse at it. Well, I think there's a fundamental distinction between a conservative mindset and a liberal mindset or a progressive mindset, right? Um, there's a lot more get in line, lockstep with a group mindset on the left. Um, and wanting to be part of a group, part of an organization, part, part of something bigger than yourself. The left has tapped into that. And maybe that's a human trait. Um, sure. But they've tapped into that. And they've, and they've kind of made it their own. We've, let, we've given up that ground in a lot of ways. Conservatives, at least the ones that are activists, I think largely want to be left alone, want to be do your own thing. Yeah. And maybe do want to uh, just come to this meeting once a month or something and talk about some political stuff and feel like a good Republican conservative. I did my part this month. That's not where it ends. That's not where it ends, folks. Um, we, need to, we need to call upon ourselves to be bigger, to be bigger, to do more. Um, well, I think, I think for Because otherwise this is what happens. Yeah, and I, th I, I want to get into specific results here in a little bit, but yeah. I think to your point, now, now is really the time to do that. The stakes did not seem as high in 2016 when we had uh, several victories to hang our hats on, and we could feel, we could have this insulary feeling right. that hey, we're just we're just a a nip and a tuck away from being a red mm -hmm. state, folks. We're not. I mean, we should have had. We're not close. We should have, by rights, by organizing rights, we should have been destroyed in 2016 because our political operation was in this in this specific area non-existent we just got carried across the finish line in a lot of races picking up some of those seats by the way that we lost yes uh in 16 yes but you in know, 2016 what do you what do you credit that to what do, hillary was a horrible candidate okay it was it, it was, it was, it was trump was not a great candidate and that's why minnesota turned out for him because we really like trump 
I don't think I, I don't think that's the case. Hillary was so bad. I think Hil- that- I, I think Hillary overcame the institutional <laughs> Democrat leanings of the state of Minnesota. But it, even then, it still couldn't get us over the finish line, no, we right? Won't. We still fell short by 40,000 votes. Yes. We picked up a lot of seats in the House. It was great. No one knew who Keith Frankie was um, on election night. Like, who's this? We haven't even been watching him. Yes. Now he's in a tight race. Did he lose? I think he, he lost. He did lo- okay, he, he lost. He, he did okay, lose. there we go. Um, Just like every, everybody. Like everybody else. <laughs> um, looking, looking, at, looking at the map, the only person who breaks through even a little point yes. into that donut is Jerry Hurtas. Jerry Hurtas. And um, he was, for all intents and he won, purposes... he won for a pretty big, in a pretty big way. I, Why? Because the Democrats didn't even think they were going to do that well, and they didn't recruit a great candidate into his district. Yeah, if you look, and, and what you can, people can do your research on your own, Jerry Hurtas' district, it's a little point that touches the, the first and second ring yeah. suburbs. Yeah. I, I want to lay this out for, because it's not just... Attorney General, which was devastating. It's not just Governor, which was devastating. It's not just our Senator seats that were devastating. We lost any foothold that we had on suburban districts. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you had people in the suburban districts who uh, were were gun control candidates. You had very moderated positions. You had personalities that fit districts. You had Republicans that were gun control candidates. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You had personalities that fit districts really yeah, well. They, they fit their district well. You had community and they staples. Got just community to the curb. Somebody like Jen Loon oh in my Eden gosh. Prairie. That, that who was hurt. a community staple. That one hurt. Everybody knew Jen Loon lost her seat. Yeah. You look at the 494, 694 suburbs, and it's all gone. Yeah. And, and not to be too doom and gloom about this, but there really is not a positive uh, to take results wise from what happened last night. The positive is, and this is, you know, we've got a podcast together, Kip and Max Save the World. Kipandmax.com. Kipandmax.com. The positive takeaway for how we save the world is take this gut check to heart. Yes. This, we need to wake up, guys. We need to wake up real hard and realize that what we're doing is not working. This party got out, out raised seven million to 600,000. This party got outworked by hundreds of thousands of doors. This party got out organized, and organized is not just in the political cycle. I'm going to say that again. Organizing is building the bench. Mm -hmm. Organizing is go down to the cities, into the city councils, into the mayor's races, into the water district commissioners. Organizing is going down and finding and recruiting people to run for office because the left is building their bench. We've got to deprive them of it. Mm-hmm. Because when you want to bring someone up, it would be great to run you know, a longtime city council member. No one really cares about his policy positions. They give him a pass because they know him. Yes, you know? there's no doubt about that. I, no, I, I, I know him, I, I know him, I like him. He's been at all the pancake breakfasts. He's at all the Lions things. He's at, the, he's at everywhere in town. He's always been around. Yep. He's a staple. He's gonna be a great representative. He gets me, he understands me. We need to build that bench. Yes. The people that fit that mold from a recruitment standpoint, it's seriously been lacking. And, I, and there are some good people in the state of Minnesota who are working on that. Um, but we need to do it more and we need to do it everywhere. No, and I do think about a lot of our good candidates who ran either statewide or at the congressional level um, fell into our laps, quite frankly, at the last second. You know, you, you talk about a guy like John Howe or Pam Myra mm-hmm. or uh, these other people were not being primed and primed to run for the position. They just happened to be qualified, good people who decided to throw their, their hat in the ring. There was no uh, there was no pruning process. You know, there was no... It wasn't even a competition for most of those offices. Well, and that's the other point, is they end up being good, qualified candidates who who did not have... You know, who did not, there was, you're right, there was not a competition. But you know, in, in a world where, and this is, I'm not going to win any friends here, we really could use a little bit stronger primary process for certain offices. Local offices like, uh, like State House and State Senate, I like the endorsement. But when it comes to 
statewide races that are expensive, congressional races that are extremely expensive, mm -hmm. Senate races that are extremely expensive. You need to show a proficiency for raising money. You need to show that you can win an election before we put you on the general ballot. Hmm. And if that means that we have two just knucklehead candidates going against each other and one of them happens to sneak through from time to time because they won the primary over a worse knucklehead, well, fine, so be it. From time to time, that happens. But if you can prove that you can raise money and start with local donors and start with the ability to actually, because you need money for the air war to wage a campaign that's successful. Right. Whether it's on broadcast, on radio, even in direct mail, I consider all that kind of an air war. Everything else is ground game. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that that played a, played a role in some yeah. of these elections, uh, especially in the case of Jeff Johnson running for governor. Um, you had groups like Alliance for a Better Minnesota yep. that dropped six, eight million dollars, six to eight million bucks between the say. primary and the general. Eight million. Well, six million on the general alone, yeah. and a lot of that was digital, but yep. a lot of it was television as well. Yep. And two million for Jeff in the primary. And I, I just, I, I don't think right <laughs> that you can say that that did not have an impact. It had an impact. Um, you know, they they thought that he was going to be the easier candidate to beat. Whatever that. Whatever you take from that, um, you know, I think uh, I think we I think we really could use the opportunity to <laughs> reassess what's going on. The endorsement we're told we're told the endorsement is a good test of grassroots support. Yep, that's really great and all if you have grassroots that actually come out and support and door knock and phone For bank sure. and utilize the data and maximize the voter contacts. For sure. If we had an operation that actually trained people how to do that, actually mobilized people to do that, I'd be far, far, far more in favor of saying, yeah, gung-ho, endorsement, rah, 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 we need to have these, we need to have a test. Mm -hmm of are these volunteers going to be excited to get out right. and do this uh, with the understanding with the understanding that be, because they are endorsing this candidate that means that they will put their they will boots put their the money for, where yeah. their money in terms of time yep. their money where their mouth is yes there's there's the challenge, there's the balance between the endorsement process which is followed by a primary mm -hmm. if now if your endorsement has a grassroots enough strength that it can overcome money in a primary you found a great general election candidate because the grassroots is where it matters. Yes. But we've seen certain primaries shake out where, you know, maybe that wasn't emblematic of grassroots support and money wasn't emblematic of, of general election capacity well, or of a long-term good representative. I think for us, it, it has always been the knock that the activists uh, attend the convention once a year and then attend the state central committee once a year and then feel like they're doing their part. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, what we're saying is that is obviously, obviously not even close to enough of what the grassroots need, needs to be. And if the grass, what I'm hearing you say is if our grassroots can't change their stripes, that the process should not be the way that it is. I think, I, I think that's accurate. I think also it's going to be easier to change the stripes, change, change the grassroots. If if they're not going to change their stripes, we can change the grassroots by bringing in new blood, mm -hmm. by specifically recruiting. This is the organizing stuff again, folks. Specifically recruiting new people into our organizations. Specifically recruiting a different caliber of, you know, honestly, and everybody who's a part of these organizations, you know what I mean. Island of Misfit Toys, it exists, um, and. We need to find an ability to bring in people that are not immediately turned off by when you show up, they get, a, they get accosted by someone who's, going, who's throwing a John Birch Society flyer in their face. Mm -hmm. right. None of us wants that. Right. I'm not going to dedicate four hours of my time over the course of, I, I'm just asking for four hours a month, folks. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to even dedicate that amount of time if I'm like, uh, really, is this the way I want to spend my time? On the left, they specifically train people how to be open and welcoming to bring in that new group of folks, mm. bring in that fresh blood. We need to seriously reassess how sociologically our organizations are structured. Right. It's not, you know, we need to reassess a lot of things. And I'm not, 
there's no there's no argument for sacrificing principles here for me. This is a purely practical situation. Of course. Purely practical. Of course. Because we can't suffer these losses any longer. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> How Let me say, we, can... <laughs> we can't afford of to course. suffer these losses of anymore. Of course, and we do have a Senate, we do have every Senate seat that, that's going to be up in another two years, state yeah. Senate seat, and I'll tell you, if the House <laughs> Senate seat, or if the, the House suburban seats are any indicator for what might happen in two years, we got two years to figure yeah. this thing out. There are a lot of Senate right. seats that now have two Democrat incumbents. Oh, yeah. All around that circle. Almost all of them. Almost all of the all suburban... All around that circle. Senate seats now that are held by Republicans and they are still out there. Mm -hmm. You are exactly right. They have now a two Republican, incumbent Democrats. Republicans, uh, a Republican senator, mm -hmm. and two Democrats under mm -hmm. them. It doesn't spell and strong Democrats. Yeah, it does not, not bad spell candidates. Victory. Strong Democrats. I think what we're trying to get at though is we can go through specific results. We're not going to have time to get yeah. into that. What people need to know is we lost. You can go cry about that on your own. We lost just about everything. We we picked up Congressional District 1. Jim Hagedorn uh, picked that one up by the skin of his Fantastic teeth. Fantastic news today. But yeah. beyond that, we lost everything. And the lesson I think we need to take away from it is exactly what you say. If we are going to compete in a naturally blue state, which this is, philosophically, if no party were to do anything, this state would lean blue. There's no doubt about it. Kip, what you're saying is we need to figure out the organization and build from the ground up, and we we basically have two years to kind of figure it out. Yep. Right now we're going to get outspent, and we got outspent at least three to one this cycle. That's fine. That, there's nothing I can do to change that. But what you can do and what we can do is start bringing in new people and training them how to use the tools that we already have available to us that states across the country where the red, where the blue wave was stopped are already using. We are just a little ways behind it. And we can pick that up. I know we can. I believe we can. With the last 30 seconds uh, of the show, Kip, what can people do if, if they're not part of an organizi organizing unit of any kind, or if they are, what can people do right now, today, tomorrow, to, to start to change things? To start to change things in their own little world? Um, you know, Perhaps reach out to folks that are already, if you're not part of your unit and you really want to get stuff changed, um, perhaps reach out to those groups and push through, even if it does feel awkward. Um, because if you bring your friends and they bring their friends and you bring like-minded folks, you can, there's a structure here, there's a process, there's a constitution, mm -hmm. you can take over the group. Right. <laughs> like, like if you don't like what you're offered, and you, and, you, and you see what it's offered and it's, it's not what you want, I mean, you can take that over. Like, it's, it's very simple. Very good. It's Kip Christian said, Get involved, folks. It's simple. Get, get involved. That is a good takeaway. Kip, thanks for joining the show today. Yeah. Anytime, Max. Thanks, brother. Thanks. This has been the Republican Roundtable. I'm Max Reimer. Until next time, but before until next time, make sure you get involved today.